Innovation Exchange 6. This is our annual meeting and um, I'm very pleased that all of you are here. Some of you have just flown in, including Louise Pulford, who just flew from the, from the UK and she arrived at 6.55 this morning. So when she sent me the, the email, I was so pleased because without her, I'm not going to know what to do. And uh, Philip Colligan, uh, uh, the executive director of NESTA, is on his way. So um, in, a, in the next 20 minutes or so, we want to warm you up. We want you to get to know each other because in the room, we've got people from Singapore, from Malaysia, Korea, uh, Thailand, uh, mainland China. We've got um, uh, representatives from Beijing, Guangzhou, uh, and Macau, and of course, Hong Kong. We've got the uh, the major players, the key players and catalysts uh, in the Hong Kong social innovation space here. So let me introduce Louise Pulver to you. Um, she is the head of SIX, uh, Social Innovation Exchange, and Louise will talk to you a little bit about SIX, and we can do a warm-up exercise together, right? Thank you, Ada. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for being here. So this is really exciting. As Ada said, we kind of did a bit of a experiment last year we were trying to be a bit innovative um, and we did a, a first gathering of lots and lots of people who have been in the global six network but who are all based in in the asia region um, and we did a gathering and we didn't know whether we would do another one but we were so pleased that during the year there's been lots of activity lots of you have been talking to each other lots of you were here last year but there were also lots of new people who weren't here last year as well so there was definitely this community forming of people who have been doing social innovation in one way or another, whether they're supporting it or thinking about it or writing it or doing it across the region. And we're really, really excited that we could do a second meeting. So before we do a, a warm up, I just want to say massive thanks to uh, Ada and her team here because as she said, I've just flown in, which is quite a luxury because I just get to arrive and come and do the fun bit. Whereas all the hard work has happened um, whilst I've been on the plane and in the past few weeks. So massive thanks to everybody here for making this happen. And particularly uh, to the jockey club <laughs> for providing us with all of this nice food and everything else that we have today. Uh, lots of coffee, that's what I'm having. Um, anyway, okay, so what you'll learn about six events, if you don't already know, is that one of the most important things about it is the chance meetings, the people that you never know who you're going to meet. And last week I heard um, a, a speech from um, a, a, a very famous innovator in the UK, a man who started something called the Eden Project, a man called Tim Schmidt. And he said he only, he accepts every third invitation he has. So he gets asked to go to loads and loads of things. He might accept some in between, but he definitely accepts every third invitation he has because he can't choose which things to go to. And by accepting, accepting every third invitation, the random things, he often has a chance meeting. So there are lots of people that um, he would never have met had he not accepted every third invitation. So, before we warm you up, I just want to quick say a quick hello to Paul Philip, who's just walked in and headed to the coffee. This is Philip Colligan, Executive Director of Nesta, who you'll meet later on. Um, anyway, so, chance meetings. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know what kind of conversation you're going to have with someone. So, everybody's going to stand up in a minute, and we're going to have two conversations with different people. So the first time you stand up, I'm going to ask you to go and find somebody that you don't know already, and have a conversation with them about how you feel this morning. So, did you have a good night's sleep? What did you have for breakfast? How was your journey here? Did you get soaked in the rain? Did you not? Just how are you feeling this morning? So the first time I'm going to do that, you'll find someone you don't know and talk to them about how you feel. Um, then I'm going to stop and ask you to go and find someone else that you don't know, that you haven't spoken to. And that person, you're going to tell them why you decided to come to this meeting today. So what was interesting about Six Asia? And that might be my colleague told me I had to come, or Ada phoned me four times and persuaded me, or I'm just really interested in this, or I came last year. It might be any of those things. So the second time you have a conversation with someone new, 
It's about why you're here today. And then a third conversation is going to happen for the rest of the day. Because at that point, I'm going to ask you to go and find someone from a different country to sit next to. Okay? So three conversations. First one, how you feel this morning. Second one, why you're here today. Third time, find someone from another country and sit next to them. Does that make sense? Yes. Hurrah. Okay, number one. Also, you'll get used to this. I shout quite a lot. Um, so after about two minutes, I'll just do a lot of noise, and then we'll stop and move on to the next one. Okay? Go. Go and find someone you don't know and tell them how you met. Asia is because <laughs> it's because she's hosting it. Okay, let's start with Jared. Jared, who are you talking to? This is So Young. Uh, she's, she's here because uh, she's from the Hope Institute and they run uh, Asian so uh, NGO Innovation Summit and she wants to see how things are done in elsewhere. Great, thank you. Why we can't do everyone, but just some random people. Okay, I was speaking to Miranda. And she's here because she wants to know more about social innovation and she's also doing a research project for MAD. And also, it's a great networking opportunity as well. Great, thank you. Pass it on to someone else. Uh, here. <laughs> uh, I'm Patricia Lau from the efficiency unit. I was talking to Bob from British Council and also Janice, a fellow colleague from the government as well. Uh, perhaps on Bob from British Council, who actually has a lot of interest in understanding what's happening around Hong Kong about social innovation and maybe exploring and networking the role of British Council in this area. Great, thank you. Hi, this is Louise from Design Institute for Social Innovation. I was talking to Sam and we shared both motivation to come here, uh, to know more people, uh, to know what social innovation could do in Hong Kong, in the world, in Asia. Great, just one more then please. Hi, I'm Scott. Um, I'm delighted to see so many representatives of the Hong Kong government here this morning, and I just met one. Anthony is with the Hong Kong Civil Service, and he's here to learn about innovation in order to go back to his workplace and to teach his colleagues. Excellent, thank you. So the final task is go and find another person that you haven't spoken to who is from a different country. Um, don't talk to them too much, you can do that later. But just sit down next to them. Okay, go.
from another city is fine because we have got people from Beijing, Guangzhou, Macau, Bangkok, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Seoul, and Hong Kong. So we've got a big crowd from Hong Kong. And now it's time to sit down. watch the video uh, which is around four and a half minutes and Louise is in the video so watch out for her I haven't seen it yet the make a difference platform is about developing people bringing out their creativity and innovation so that they in turn bring positive changes to society mad is important to open your mind they can build a future of mindsets the fact that it's bringing together young people from completely different cities across Asia to just have the space to stop and think and be creative and go mad, I think is just invaluable. <laughs> Everyone provided a lot of uh, skills and different ideas here, uh, which I shall uh, implement when I once I will return back to Pakistan. Once we are willing to stand up, speak out, take action against bullying, against prejudice, against injustice, that we suddenly realize the enormous power we have. Because I think that I can contribute, you can contribute, so we can make our skills together and make it a 
以有海軍巡航嘅呢一個地方，呃、其實係有可能係咁活生生嘅。唔同背景嘅人、呃、都可以參與到，或者可以做到一啲佢自己認為係藝術嘅嘢咯。香港係好少、呃、文化或者藝術嘅團體係可以誒咁、呃、勇敢。咁去用一種咁樣嘅方式去做一個咁大型嘅 program 出嚟咯。呢、這個棚係我同誒三個朋友一齊設計嘅。雖然話、呃、我哋係做即係做 creative business， 咁但係即係都好被動嘅，我自己覺得。同 Mac experience 好唔同嘅。咁我依家覺得嘢真係要放開呢條 safety bell 咁樣啦，佢真係做出嚟先可以帶到更加多嘅。你要让你的年轻人抱着希望，让你自己抱着希望，让他可以看得到你未来的发展。其实个个都可以嘅 ，difference， 每一个人都可以做到嘅。用自己最中意嘅嘢去解决自己最中意嘅嘢，咁原来系一个 model 嚟嘅。咁我就系其中一个可能被启发咗嘅一个人，就做一少少嘢啦。咁如果每个人咧都咁样去做少少嘢嘅话咧，其实成个社会就会不断咁样去滚落去，咁持续性咧就会系越嚟越强。You want to support something that's going to create a new mentality. That's going to make people want to think. You want to support something that's going to create a new mentality. That's going to make people want to think. You want to support something that's going to create a new mentality. 
about where we came from and why we started SIX. So SIX was started about six years ago now uh, in the UK, but as a global network. And the premise was that there are people that are doing this better than us somewhere else, and we want to learn from them. So we don't want to just celebrate um, the heroes, the people with the swanky ideas. This was not about supporting individual entrepreneurs specifically. There are many networks that do that. But it was really focused on learning, on learning from people that we thought were doing something better than us. So the premise was that everybody has got something to learn. And when we, when we started SIX, there weren't very many social innovation organisations around the world. Um, and there were even less in 1990. So if you Googled social innovation in 1990, you came up with one reference, which was a little man, he's, he's not that little, but a man, um, sitting in Vienna, Austria, uh, with a couple of colleagues running something called the Centre for Social Innovation. They're an academic research centre for social innovation. 22 years later, there are countless, um, countless records of social innovation if you click Google from businesses, from cities, from governments at all levels, from corporations, from private companies, from community groups to individuals. And 1,713 are the organisations registered on the internet that have social innovation somewhere in their title. That might be a university department as well. But you can just see how much it's grown. And, and as social innovation has grown around the world, that's why SIX has as well, because there are more people doing it and more people wanting to learn from each other. Um, so the idea of SIX Network, people find sometimes a little bit hard to understand if you're outside of it. I think when people are in it and they recognise the value of connecting with people very honestly and learning from them, it's easier. But just so you understand, the idea of SIX is that we create a network where people can share these things. When they, where they can share the ideas that work, wherever it is, where they can share the talents, the capabilities, the skills you need to do it, and the social innovation um, studio workshop that we'll be doing over the weekend is around how you develop those capacities within people to do it, um, where people can get the access to the power, whether it's um, through a funder, or whether it's through a government, or whether it's through an institution, that the power they need to be able to innovate is really important. But we also want to see a place where people have enough resource to be able to do this. So this is the kind of premise of SIX. And just so you really understand where we're coming from, it's a very non-hierarchical, flat network where, as I said, everybody has something to learn from each other. Everyone has something to give. So our values are really important to us. Um, obviously we have six of them, uh, but just so you know, this is the kind of way that we want to connect with each other. So our focus is on impact, it's not just about talking, it's about people who are really doing things. We like solutions, not just the, the, um, the heroes, not just the well-known people that you know about, but actually this is about learning from everybody, everywhere, even if the people are less well-known. It's about honesty. It's about really being open and honest where things don't work as much as where they do, because everyone's got something to learn. And even we're not very good at that, but we're really, really trying. It's about doing things rather than just talking about them. And it's about all learning from each other. So there is no one in this room that is more or less important than anyone else in this conversation today. We all come from very, very different backgrounds. We've all got an equal amount to learn from each other. So it's about connecting as peers when we come to six. Um, and finally, about being open. So we love the unexpected. So that's just a little bit of information about where we are with six. But as Ada said, this is not the only six node. A couple of weeks ago, um, we had a launch of Six Australia. Um, and unfortunately, Christian, who's running Six Australia, can't be with, it, with, with us here today. Uh, but he did make a little video for us. I haven't seen this yet, but he sent me an apology video, uh, apology email, because he says he looks silly in it. I said, I'm sure it's fine, we'll watch it anyway. So a little message from Christian in Six Australia. Oh, he does look quite silly. Six 
I've been involved in SIGS Global for the last few years and I've been extremely fortunate to have spent time in Asia with all of you, visiting the beautiful Jeju Island and Seoul for Arnas for the last couple of years. Um, I've hosted a delegation of South Korean innovators and government officials here in Australia earlier this year. Um, I've been involved in running workshops in Hong Kong and was very fortunate to have been present at the official launch of SIGS Asia last year. So I'm thrilled to be speaking to you today. Um, these are just some of the examples of the opportunities that everyone can have um, by being a part of our global community. The world we live in is connected now like never before, and I think we saw that last uh, lots year. Lots and lots of activities and lots of things where we will be discussing later on. Uh, but we thought it would be helpful to give you an overview from some of the participants of what social innovation means to them in their countries and what their organisations in particular are doing in terms of the work of this field. So we've used a Petra style presentation, but not exactly the same. And uh, we um, have some great volunteers from uh, across the region who have volunteered to um, talk a little bit about social innovation and what it means in their country. So, without further ado, uh, can I introduce our first Petra speaker? This is Jared Tam from uh, Singapore. Uh, we met Jared probably in 2009, I think, in Europe, when Jared came to his first six event. And um, Jared works for the Lien Centre of Social Innovation, who was also one of our hosts a couple of years ago. So, over to Jared. Hi, my name is Jared. I'm with the Lien Centre for Social Innovation. We're a joint venture between the Family Foundation, the Lien Foundation, and the University. And we are a capacity builder for nonprofits, and we promote social innovation. And what we mean by social innovation, very simply, is new ideas that help people that work. And we believe that social innovation blossoms at the intersection between the three sectors, the private, public, and people sector. Uh, research that we do. In the top left, you see this book called The World That Changes the World. It's about the social <coughs> ecosystem. Uh, on the rest of the top row, you see some research monographs that we've published. And on the bottom row, this is social space. This is our annual publication. We put out five editions each already. And it's basically like a practitioner-oriented journal. So we collate uh, articles from social innovators around the world. And all these articles are also available for download from website. Uh, we do a bunch of conferences. So these are social innovation conferences. You see Jeff Morgan as a superhero over here. So we caricatured our speakers, including the president of our university. You may know Yvonne Lee. Uh, we also do uh, innovate in the format of the conference. For example, we run breakouts in toilets. Uh, we've segregated our participants into high uh, high, middle, and low class, and the low class people sat on benches and ate porridge. We do a capacity building workshop called ILE. Uh, it's a course, 15 modules. It's like a mini MBA for how to be a non-profit leader, and we've run four cohorts of this already. Uh, we also do social conversations. These are ad hoc um, seminars where thought leaders get to share their experiences with a wider audience. And here we are doing a, a World Cafe style event. We have done some research on the biggest needs in Singapore. We've identified six of them. And uh, I would say the biggest need in Singapore is the foreign workers. Because they're, they're not treated like uh, people with social needs. They're treated as units of work, labor. And, because, and also because they don't have voting rights, so government feels less uh, inclined to support the needs that they have. Uh, and we have a small ecosystem going on. So lately, we've had Ashoka Singapore set up. Right? Chris Kusama is hitting that. We have the hub now, uh, the Asian Venture and Philanthropy Network. Uh, Tongi from School of Thought is here. So you can hear about what he's doing. Uh, Impact Investment Exchange Asia is trying to set up a social stock exchange for Asia. Who is the biggest uh, social innovator in Singapore? 
Although you've seen, there are a lot of players, but really I feel that the biggest social innovator in Singapore is really the government. Because since the start, of, since the founding of our country, uh, the government has played a big role. Uh, it's a city state, so it's, there's a lot of opportunities for experimenting and innovating at a scale which affects the entire country. Uh, so, um, and these are the examples which we have. For example, we have congestion pricing for our roads. Uh, for Singaporeans, this is a pain, but for other countries, they consider it a social innovation. Uh, and it does help uh, make things smoother in the city. We have a fantastic water policy. For example, we turn our rivers into reservoirs. So this is a dam that basically created the Marina Bay area. Uh, we do um, waste water treatment and we turn that into drinkable water, we call it new water. And what Singapore really does well, I mean, this view that you have didn't exist four decades ago. If you look at the red lines, that is where the coastline used to be. All that is reclaimed land. So the government from four decades ago decided that we want to do this, we want to create this view. And they had the, the vision, the foresight, the planning to, to reclaim the land, let the land settle, find private developers to build on it. And foresight planning, I think that's what Singapore excels at. And last slide, the challenges for social innovation. One, I think Singapore lacks entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, in Hong Kong, you may have this, uh, if there's no rules, we might as well do it. Well, in Singapore, it's like, if there's no rules, we, may as, we might as well not try. And the other issue I feel is, is we have a very grant-dependent non-profit sector. Uh, a lot of work that's being done, especially in social services, if there are no grants, no subsidies, no schemes to support it, people won't do it. And so it becomes a more like an outsourced kind of um, uh, economy where, where non-profits don't dare to do too much beyond what government defines as the agenda. Melinda. Melinda is from uh, Scope Group in Malaysia. Um, so we're going to leave it to you, Melinda, to tell us a little bit more. impact consultancy and we call it that because our work is really focused on generating impact for those who help others so we've been working in social innovation since about 1993 um, starting in Denmark and now we're in Kuala Lumpur and working globally and one of our first major projects is actually engaging with government stakeholders to address uh, issues of crime reduction and HIV AIDS through the treatment of drug users so that was a project that it now affects hundreds of thousands of people in Malaysia and had to engage multiple stakeholders to change the user behavior of people working uh, in addiction. And we have tons of data to support the impact of these projects and really been using that to branch out into fields like health and development, uh, social innovation, and social enterprise. So just a brief history of social innovation in Malaysia. Um, I'd like to echo what uh, the representative from Singapore was saying in that a lot of it is backed uh, by the government. We've seen an increased focus on innovation and technology since 2005. 
And a lot of these have, uh, I would say that was an inflection point. You saw a swing toward technology, a swing toward metrics, a, a swing toward trackable impact. And we really see that as being a multi-stakeholder process and one that has really uh, evolved to include more facets, including CSR, social innovation, um, and a burgeoning social enterprise sector. So there are many opportunities uh, for social innovation. There are both opportunities and uh, challenges. Um, so in Malaysia, it's a, a quote unquote rich country, but you also have an urban rural divide. So how do we bridge the social innovation landscape between these drastically different um, scenarios? And how do we create a common framework to look at opportunities? Uh, we have good infrastructure, um, but the, the social mindset can be very difficult. Uh, social innovation doesn't exist in a vacuum. Everyone has an original way that they intend to do things, want to do things, and creating a new language for collaboration uh, is a process. So we see fast development and increasing cost of living, and also a lot of youth relocating into the cities. So how do we create value in both environments? We see ethnic, uh, ethnic tensions, uh, and like I said, urban versus rural uh, is a growing, growing issue. And of course, youth unemployment. So how can the social innovation sector uh, be a driver in terms of either value creation or job creation, and how do we harness those forces to create more uh, social good in our environments? So the social innovation ecosystem um, is very uh, multifaceted and o overlapping in some ways. We have, of course, the private sector, uh, NPOs and NGOs, the government, and social enterprise. And I think a lot of the dialogue that we've been hearing recently about social innovation and social innovation in Malaysia has really focused on the social enterprise sector. Um, we see it more broadly. Uh, social innovation can't take place without multiple stakeholders at the table. So how do we create forums to bring those people together uh, in meaningful collaborations that can create and drive, drive impact? So it involves taking a risk to join a new social, social innovation and social economy. So how do we, we get policymakers to engage with nonprofits? How do we bring youth to the table? How do we engage the communities that are really impacted by social innovation? One of the things we've really noticed in Malaysia is that a lot of the people working in social innovation right now actually aren't from the communities that they aim to impact. How do we create forums where those voices can come forward? How do we empower user-driven solutions? So we want to foster social innovation. And one of the ways that we see doing this is by accelerating the transition to innovation by the people, empowering those people, empowering youth, empowering the different communities that have a stake in driving the social innovation agenda, and linking stakeholders and connecting regions. Um, like I said, social innovation uh, for us is not in a vacuum, and the stakeholders can be diverse within our country and outside of it. I think the more that we think of social innovation in Malaysia or in Kuala Lumpur as exceptional, uh, the harder it is for us to take lessons from elsewhere. So we really want to be part of the networks that allow for us to learn from others in forums like this. Um, so one of the things I would say that uh, has been very successful in Malaysia is actually creating space for the social innovation sector. So more and more there's a movement toward creating space for change makers. And by space I mean both physical space, spaces like this, spaces where youth can come together and have open dialogue, and spaces where it's safe to engage in topics that that need innovation, but might be a little bit taboo. And one of the ways that we've been doing this is through uh, what we call impact jams. So we've had uh, a service impact jam where teams have come together for a weekend to reinvent public service delivery. We've had government jams, uh, just one earlier this week, where members of the government have come together uh, from across ministries and said, how can we work together um, to better, better the situation? And we've also been embracing social entrepreneurs. And a lot of that involves uh, incubation, funding, and mentorship. And with a combination of those three things, we've been able to empower, empower youth in particular, um, but also to create a more vibrant uh, social innovation sector. And that can be for those working in governments, for those working in more traditional organizations, and also, of course, for people looking to start their own organizations and social entrepreneurs. Um, one of our community-led interventions uh, has been uh, called the Human Library. And that's a project that takes place in about 30 countries. Um, and that brings together people to face prejudices that work in their society. So we have a drug user, we have a teen mom, we have all of these people who might be stereotyped and typecast. And instead of taking out a book, you're taking out a person. And by sitting there face to face and confronting your own prejudice, uh, we hope that you can learn something about those around you. So I'm actually based in Taiwan myself. So just as a point of contrast, um, there's a lot of focus on aspirational social entrepreneurs and aspirational social innovation. 
Um, we think that we need to, to move past this to drive the conversation further. Um, so our early stage conclusions, um, I think that I've reiterated is that social innovation is not in a vacuum. We need all of the stakeholders to be working together um, to drive the sector forward, and that change of practice can lead to, lead to change of policy. So it's by doing actions um, that we can lead to, to large scale change. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, we should have got you to do two. Uh, a Taiwan and a Malaysia presentation. Maybe you can do Taiwan later as a dance. Okay, great. Yeah, great, good. Um, now we're going to welcome Nui, but I can't say your name properly. So will you? Thank you, Louis. Um, I mean, I, I have to go after Jared and Melinda. What a shame. Um, I have about uh, 30 minutes to prepare this presentation, so Hopefully you will be forgiving me. Um, I work for Ashoka in Thailand, in Bangkok. I believe that some of people here already know Ashoka. Some may not. Uh, Ashoka work to support, we believe, people who will create such innovations. Those um, blue fish that cannot go in the mainstream, cannot be reasonable. Um, this is some of the fellows we work with. I think you're familiar with Dialogue in the Dark, of course. and. Um, Wikipedia, slow food movement, and all these um, amazing, amazing social innovations. So for Ashoka, for people who work at Ashoka, I believe we don't talk much about this work within Ashoka, but um, if we consider social entrepreneur to be supporting, um, creating social innovation, we believe that social innovation is a new idea with a creative, innovative designs of practice that have potential to create systematic social change. Uh, for Bangkok, this is one of the biggest problems I see. Not the traffic jam, not the pollution. Can you guess, like on the left hand side, what is it? And on the right hand side, what is it? The left hand side is the prominent, biggest, most famous high school in Thailand. And on the right hand side, it's when the student from that school go at night. It's a tutoring school. So in Thailand, tutoring school are a hundred times bigger and better than normal schools. So education for us is the biggest problem right now. Thailand invests uh, in education, I think like the, the second most uh, from the GDP, but uh, the, the result is not as big. Same thing here, we have a lot of inequality. You can see this picture everywhere. On the left hand side, you live on $1 a day, and on the right hand side, you can imagine. The third thing is environment, extremely, extremely um, important for us. And I think it's a trend in our region, right? We are entering aging society. And of course, we have no innovation in Thailand to cope with that. So I, read, I, I spent three days talking to people, trying to understand the uh, social innovation landscape in Thailand. Right now, uh, the Thai, the, in the middle, the Thai Social Enterprise Office played a very important role trying to set up this sector. They talk with the government, and the government's still thinking that social innovation is something about science and technology. So there'll be a lot of trip to UK, there'll be a lot of trip to Hong Kong before our government understand that. And also, we consider ourselves a big partner. We work with Chain Fusion, which is another nonprofit, and university. So right now, what we're trying to do is get this sector going. So in the next 12 months, there will be one social innovation lab happen, and we'll be uh, classes at bachelor degree teaching about social innovation in Thailand. So for us, social innovation in Thailand is a baby step, very baby step. We will look into uh, people's sector there. You see a lot of good initiatives, but not yet an innovation. But what we do well is that in Thailand, we, if, if we look at that great initiatives, because, because of a lot of problems, Thai people come up with creative solutions. So we have innovation in the process. Like for example, this uh, homeless kids problem, our NGOs, one of uh, our sugar fellows, design the school, design the program that, that the police have to want to teach the homeless students. So this process creates, sensitizes police on this problem, and they don't see um, homeless kids as criminal, but as a result of a social problem. And also we have tiny 30,000 grassroots uh, organizations everywhere. 
if Thai people can teach monkeys to collect coconut and then train monkey to assist the police in peace making, I think Thai people can do a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nui. Very helpful. And again, just to reiterate, these, everyone's in the room from very different experiences, so hopefully we can elaborate on these conversations later. Um, now, I would love to introduce you to, um, to So Young from uh, the Hope Institute in, um, in, South, in Seoul, in South Korea. Good morning. My name is So Young. I am from South Korea. It's the, uh, South Korea is a Hope Institute. Is a kind of civic independent organization. So we call ourselves as a think and do tank. So we do research project. We also manage and organize a series of participation program, and we collaborate with the government. So now we will start the what happened in South Korea when it comes to social innovation field. Yeah. So South Korea also faces a lot of social problems. I think social innovation is a new, new approach to address social projects. So we also do many pro uh, so definition of social innovation in Korea is very new. So people don't know what is social innovation, why are they talking about the social innovation. But people know they have to address such a problems in, by using the new ways. So we do and promote social innovation in Korea. First story is the empty house. Empty house is a kind of co-housing co or uh, sharing house project. In Korea, the price of a house is very high. So, so even ordinary young people cannot buy. Even they save their whole salary for 10 years and 20 years. So they started to give up following the, those trends and they started to new projects. So they rent a new house, rent a one house, and they shared it their place and there they make their house the, as a community. So now house is just like an investment vehicle in Korea. So they want to change those kind of ideology. And so they want to, uh, their idea put into in practice. So now uh, it became, it started with uh, about one house. Now it became 11 houses in Seoul. And there's also new trends about the cooperatives. As you all know, the last year was the UN declared the uh, year of the cooperatives. So uh, as you see the graph, in December, in December there was a 136. Now it's about 3.5% uh, growth in the cooperatives. So, so two pictures shows the how people use the cooperatives and what do they do. The so one is the cooperative of social solar power. People uh, gather together and invest money and they just uh, build as a solar power system in, on the roof of the public building or school. And then they sell that electricity to the uh, solar supply company in Korea. So they just uh, want to uh, put the practice that they are renewable energy bridging system in Korea. And the other one is that uh, another cooperative model is a happy lunch box. It's kind of a free lunch program in Korea. It's kind of a social enterprise. So it is collaboration. It, collabor it, it started with the collaboration with the, uh, a big companies, foundations, financial support. And maybe some of you know already know about the Songmisan village. Songmisan is the name of the mountain. Is a kind of urban community. It is located in the west part of the Seoul. So it is, you know, the Seoul is very big city. So there is a lot of apartments. So we think that there is no community. So we are a bit among between people. But some of young people started to change their those kind of a uh, broken, <laughs> broken lifestyle. So they, they started a kind of a cooperative children care program in 1990s. So the parents, parents do the children care, cooperative children care programs together, and now they open the alternative school and the cooperatives and cafes. So those the area is a map of the Songmisan village. The those those in those area there's many 
cooperatives, social enterprises, and the other uh, civic groups and activities. So maybe if you visit the Korea, maybe you can see the Sangmisan village. There's another case of the community building case. Uh, Sangmisan village is <laughs> kind of community building project. It's kind of alternative redevelopment program. As you know, the urban city is a very poor area. So there's a, a evicted people, there's an area that evicted people live there. But so they don't have anything to do. Uh, the government also don't care what they're about their environment. So they want to change their environment by themselves. So some of the young people go there and then they change, they repair the house and they, they repair the infrastructure. So they just change their areas, their houses, and their community in an innovative way. It is. <laughs> oh, I have to, I prepared too much pictures, I guess. <laughs> It is a division, division restaurant. Division is a kind of very, uh, division is a name of village in the rural area. And so in rural area is traditionally there's no, there's a uh, decreasing incomes, decreasing incomes and people uh, living their villages. So there's no income, to, income resources to uh, sustain their lives. So they have to find ways to uh, increase their incomes and uh, you know, pe uh, invite people to live their area. So the Bibi Bibi Zhang village made a made a uh, baker restaurant, and then they hire women, they the housewives, and then they share their recipes and their they sell their uh, food. So many people just visit and then this restaurant is we we think is the best practice. So actually, it is a part of the bigger community business project. Is a one Jew municipal government and the whole institute uh, do together. So it is an uh, issue is that how the rural area um, build their community. And there in Seoul, there is another kind of project is uh, maybe you, uh, everyone is a school or zero zero is college. It means that. Hong Kong, you can say you can say that Hong Kong is a school, that well, Singapore is a school. So like that, um, traditionally think education and service education can be done by the educated people or educated people or the instructor. But we think we have to change the uh, cities can be teacher. So so in that program, the even high school student, housewives, housewives, so in laundry shoppers also teach their experiences, information, and so they communicate together by the, by gathering together in, in the program. So maybe it's the last, maybe it's the last, last thing. It is our social innovation park. As you know, the, our founder, the Mr. Park, became a mayor of Seoul City. He, after he elected the mayor, he started a social innovation program and uh, strongly support the social innovation. So he made a uh, repair some old public buildings, and then he he reestablished the new building. And the social innovators, the social enterprise people uh, gather together and they communicate in the in this building. So if you maybe I guess you should have some more questions, and <laughs> okay, maybe we can talk later. Thank you very much. So young, young, um, have to encourage everybody to go to Seoul um, and look at all of these projects because there are so many great examples of community-led innovation in Seoul. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'd like to welcome Joyce Jo. Uh, welcome Joyce to tell us a little bit about, um, this is a quite a big task, I guess. Six minutes on social innovation in the whole of mainland China. <laughs> Best of luck. It's, it's really tough because I have been traveling for several weeks and don't have much time to work on the PPT. So I have no pictures on the text, so forgive me for that one. Uh, so you, you notice that I actually for, work for two organizations, that is Civil Rights Center and Intel China. Why? Because that we have, I started to work for Intel and, and Intel actually doing a lot of the social innovation projects all over the world. 
and we are trying to use the business solutions to solve uh, solve a social problem, tackle social problems. We have a business unit called uh, Work Ahead, so which is actually focused on the digital to, to get the bridge the digital digital divide. And we actually started uh, around two, uh, 22 decades ago. And then in China, we actually started uh, focused on social innovation as a pillar of CSR uh, in, in 2009. And at that time, we started a new program called the Innovation Initiative for Nonprofit, which is to encourage the uh, nonprofit organization in China to provide the social solutions and to help them to build their uh, capacity and also deliver effective and impactful solutions. So that is the program. And after three years, we found it that that is quite necessary to open the platform to the, to the, to the whole society, to the third party. So we decided to establish a, a profile organization to focus on to build the platform and develop the platform. So that is why we have the Social Innovation Center. We actually got get in the register this year. And so that is the, the, the history of, the, of, of both of the organizations focused on the social innovation in China. And uh, talking about the social innovation in China, because, and particularly for the, for the, for the, uh, the structure, infrastructure, social infrastructure in China, we actually have, everybody knows that we have a very big government. The government actually want to do something, a lot of things. They want to do everything and take care of everything. And they want to, to do uh, something actually mission impossible. And, uh, and also business, because for all businesses, they have very great opportunities. Because it's a, it's, they have the very economic, fast economic growth. And they have a lot of the opportunities. They have a big population, a big coal market. And uh, they, they, if they follow the government agenda, and if they follow the uh, government charter, if they have the market opportunity, uh, and follow the market rule, they can just they have a very big opportunity. But for the profit, so it's, it, if it, it should be much smaller than this one. So that actually, they're not a big opportunity for the profit organizations in China and they don't have the capacity, they don't have the talent, they don't have the resources, they don't have skills, knowledge, network, everything they don't, they, they, they almost have nothing. So, so that is in the now, but in future, and we are trying to build a kind of the platform and also kind of mechanism to try to balance the three sectors and to get them have a very balanced development, but not necessarily become the same big, but it's kind of a balanced, and to try to get collaborative to deliver solutions together. So that is our mission of the organization. Although the, the Sinovate Center is a small organization, but it's, a, it's going to build a platform, which is to, to get together, to get everybody together, and who, who want to build the platform, who want to get a, to help the three sectors to work together. So that is the, our mission. And uh, then in China, actually, we, social innovation is pretty, pretty new in mainland China. And we don't have much people who quite understand social innovation. And also, they don't have much experience in social innovation. So one of the things that we want to do, that is to create a bigger base for social innovation, which means to attract more people get into the social innovation process. So that is, we want to focus on the soul of the earth, which is in the middle class people, and they, they, have, the, they, they, they have a very good income. They, they born in the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. They're still young, and they, they, they're actually quite resourceful. And they might from companies from media arts and from their profits. And they also maybe have the professional, uh, they, they care about social impact, they have mission, they have face, they have the desire to change, care about uh, society. So we want to attract those people to get involved, to understand social innovation and get involved into the social innovation uh, uh, business and practices. So that is, that is the target, the, the people that we target. And so, so in, in China, we think that social innovation is actually a kind of network. 
to build a network which is to they can people can get together and collaborate for impact and then those they can tackle the social challenges they also can meet the needs from the bottom of the pyramid because actually it's it's even the need from the uh, bottom of the pyramid is also the market that is kind of the emerging market just like the Dr. Yunus, they focus on the, on, on the needs, uh, financial needs of the bottom of the pyramid and get profit. So, so then they do have the market there. So, and also for the, for the, for the uh, it's not actually the history of the social movement in China. That is actually the history of the philanthropy or the profit in China. And before the 2008, the Sutra earthquake, Actually, we only have the welfare factory, so which is means to to recruit some of the people who are in the, in the underserved, and so they and also we have the gango. Gango means government supporting the NGOs, and also we have some a very small amount of the grassroots. And then starting after the earthquake, we have a lot of the new grassroots, and we also have the private comp uh, private foundation. A lot of companies established uh, their foundations. And also, we have a strong gungles, uh, and the outlook that we think that we ha there will be more companies to build their their private foundation, foundations, even public foundations. Well, we have more professional and profit organizations, but not only grassroots. And also, we have we will have more social. My time's up, so um, it's really a big <laughs> important <laughs> potent slide. So just give one minute to explain. It. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so so it, it, it's, it is actually very important because this is the, the charter of the new government. You know that we have the new leadership in China and then the, the, the president, Xi, uh, the, he, he talked about the China dream. So what is a China dream? China dream means that they, they have to be the people, the society have to be the people oriented. And the government would, would love to share the wealth with the people. So, and also they want to people have the well-being life. They they're happy in life. Have, a, have lead a happy life. And also, besides the economy, the, the government will also put much e efforts in society, environment, and culture. So after the Cultural Revolution, the and thirty years of quick uh, e economic development. Actually, in China, we, we, we lost a lot of the culture. So currently, we have to rebuild the culture. And then, so we have kind of a balanced, balanced between the economic growth and the social infrastructure, uh, infrastructure construction. And in, in the economic uh, growth, we, the government still focus on the GDP. But, but besides GDP, they also have, have to build a kind of infrastructure who can focus on to provide the better public services for the for the for, for, for the for the for the entire country, such as the education, environment, healthcare, aging, culture, and etc. So, so actually, what is lacking in, in China to 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 mobilize social wisdom? That is actually the mechanism. In China, we don't have the mechanism to have the different people to have the different organization to work together. To, to work on the to tackle the social problems and to tackle the to tackle the social challenges. So the only although we have a lot of social problems, that is not the key. The key is that how to build a mechanism, how to build an ecosystem to have the people can collaborate and to to work up, work together. So that is the key. So I think that's all. Um, and okay, hope I, I do a good job. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joyce. It was very interesting. I know lots of people will have lots of questions, so we can continue to discuss today. Um, next up is Macau. So please can we welcome Dingwa Mac. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, actually, this is our very first time presenting um, Macau to setting like this. So, and this PowerPoint is prepared by uh, my partner Sam. That we, we worked in the last two days for I don't know how many hours. We, we didn't see it at all. 
actually. So we, we went and actually interviewed people because we want fresh updated information for, for you. And so if we haven't got anything clear, uh, we can talk about that later. Okay. Now, uh, we are not babies, we are infants. We just registered ourselves <laughs> last week <laughs> and under uh, the government uh, as an NGO, it's named Macau Social Entrepreneurship Education Association. We want to put the word education there because we are we're not even learning, we're looking. We are fully inspired by MAD. I came to Ada's event for four years, sponsored by the cultural department in Macau. And we have been looking and thinking and we go back to now, last week. Now, we are, these are some pictures of what we do. We go into schools and, and tell them we are doing something. We are looking, we are going to Hong Kong. And, uh, and uh, these are my students. And uh, uh, yes, I teach, I, I'll tell you later. But uh, we do some training. And um, we, are, we are trying to uh, create a platform for young professionals and, and uh, for students to meet young professionals from Macau, because this part is lacking. Um, I'll tell you more later, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, some history of social innovation in Macau. Uh, before I go into innovation, I want to tell you that Macau has been, uh, gambling has been the leading industry since 1847. That's earlier than Las Vegas, so. Uh, just we, gambling is the only thing we have, uh, but but um, I want I, I'm trying. I was asking everybody in in Macau, and they told me actually some artists from the art sector they have been trying to to you know do something to show people we have more than uh, just gambling and and the media. I'll show you some pictures later. And the social welfare organization or NGO they. Uh, uh, sponsored by the government and they are trying to do something uh, with young people. Okay, uh, this is uh, what I mean by the, the media. This is, uh, uh, in Chinese it's called Sun Sang Doi and uh, uh, the, I think there's a new generation monthly. Now th this is a monthly uh, magazine that is uh, founded by Agnes Lam in Macau and uh, they, they, they started this because uh, in the traditional media, they don't go into in-depth uh, investigation or, or um, they don't tell us history or other social um, problems in Macau. So youth, this is a youth magazine. So youth, are, actually they, they don't have any information about uh, social problems. So through this magazine, they can learn. Meow space. Uh, this is actually found, uh, co founded by a, a, by, by a Hong Kong designer. But uh, as you can see, they, they do with uh, um, pets and actually pe uh, 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 domestic pets. They, they want to show care, they want to uh, uh, increase the awareness of, uh, of uh, uh, in young people uh, or people in general in Macau uh, having attention to, to, to pets. Okay, from the, uh, these pictures I got from an association, a youth association, and as you can see, they're trying to give some positive energy uh, to Macau people in the street and dress like, dress like they, they did the, the costume by themselves, and uh, like SpongeBob and Superman and, and all that. Okay, neat. I put down two points. One is education, second is uh, elderly services. The reason why I put education is because uh, we have eight universities, you know that. We have eight universities in Macau, but we don't have local trained doctors. We don't have. We don't have doctor programs and like uh, occupational therapy programs. And many, there are many programs are missing in Macau. And, and our, our traditional education is it's very old fashioned. And I want to include our English, le English level is very low in Macau because our official language is Portuguese and Chinese. So in, in traditional school, English is, is not like a compulsory, uh, they, they have to master this language. They don't have, even have to write in, in English.
education. So, so we need professionals from other countries, from other cities to, to help us. And elderly services, as you know, you know um, we don't have doctors. We don't have enough doctors. All the doctors are imported. And, and um, therapists, uh, uh, we need training. And, and this is what I'm, I'm currently uh, networking with some Hong Kong local uh, institution who has been providing these services. So we will continue to do that. And um, our big challenge, <laughs> low unemployment rate. We have almost zero unemployment rate. Everybody has a job or two jobs or three jobs. And that's why if we want to you know, make some uh, noises or we, if we want to, to create a, a hub, nobody will come. We have money. The government pay, will pay, but nobody will come. Because all the students are so busy having three part-time jobs and, and, and the, they, they have a lot of pressure from their parents because at the dinner table, the parents will ask them, why don't you get a part-time, why are you doing things with Miss Mac? And, and which does not bring money home. 30 seconds left, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, language barrier, high rental costs, uh, I'll tell you that later. And, uh, Yes, we, we need we need other industries. We we need that, and people they don't think they, they think that money is the most important thing, which is ridiculous. Now, strengths of Macau. I called many many people yesterday, and they have been telling me the same. The most important resource that we have, other than gambling casinos, it's the historical rich historical background. This is just you know a uh, 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 sorry times up. I, I, if you go to Macau, you see this everywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, have, I, I went to interview them. This name is called Lata. Lata is this, this container which you used to, uh, it's Portuguese, it, you used to put your lunch in there. And uh, they're trying to create some rejuvenate programs in the local community. And they're all freelancer. And uh, actually, Hitchhiker, I want to show you this. Macau is a very small place. We, it's only 30 square kilometer. And this app is created for us. We just need to log in and tell and check in on Facebook through this app and our friends will uh, carpool you to a place where you need to go. And everybody has a car in Macau. Not everyone, every household. And we have the highest density of car density in the world, which is a big problem. And second, second hand, I think Macau is the most successful I would say most successful because we have uh, a small place. It's very easy for us to go and check what kind of secondhand use things uh, uh, people have on Facebook or some other social networking site. And we usually I can get what I want the same day. So we are very small. And and um, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Social Innovation in Hong Kong. Just a bit of background. I ask Ada to do this quite often in Seoul, in the US, in Europe. Um, and Ada said to me this time, maybe we should get someone else to do the overview of Hong Kong. But I think Ada gives such a, a great overview because of her 25 different jobs and experiences. Um, so we look forward to hearing from the rest of you later on. But sorry, Ada. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Louise. So this is the last presentation, and it's me, and it's about Hong Kong. I'm mindful of the fact that we have all the players uh, in this room. So when I was doing this, I only had about one hour doing this at 7 a.m. this morning. Um, I was so afraid that I would miss out on, on somebody. So I mean, my apologies first if your organization and your name has not been mentioned, because I think uh, Things are really looking good in Hong Kong. Last year this time, 
um, we had a, a similar presentation and we have a lot of questions. We say, you know, we want the government to, uh, uh, to support us more and we want the business sector to support us more. And we see the gaps, uh, we see the rich poor gap, we see the housing problem and we see education issues in Hong Kong. Um, and finally, things are really looking good, okay? With, first of all, our Chief Secretary um, taking the lead, um, and, and I think this is a very important and symbolic um, move. Um, uh, since uh, July last year, uh, a new fund was announced, and this is the 500 million Social Innovation and Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship Development Fund. Uh, this is under the Commission on Poverty, and Patricia there, um, is still that. Uh, she's, uh, she belongs to the Secretariat. So for us, um, it is good news, not just because of the money, but it's that the government is supporting social innovation and recognizing the power of social innovation in addressing and solving our social issues. Uh, I, I always have to start with KK because he's like the guru. Like. Uh, and um, KK, uh, what KK did last year, and I think it is also very important, he started a social enterprise himself called Education for Good. And uh, this is a catalyst. He goes to all the universities in Hong Kong and say, come on, do something in social entrepreneurship. Do something, talk about innovation, talk about entrepreneurship. And he was extremely successful. And I have seen that uh, last year, a lot of new initiatives took place. Um, the first one at um, Chinese University of Hong Kong, Professor Joseph Sung, the president of Chinese U, started the eye care program. So this is a social and civic engagement program for Chinese university students. And uh, I believe that they will be given seed money and um, you know, to um, uh, start social projects to make an impact. Then we have more, we have from the Hong Kong University, uh, XL3, and uh, Matt is also collaborating with the General uh, Education Unit, which, uh, and Chi Chung is over there. And so that's Hong Kong U. We have from the City University Project Flame, and they've done a social enterprise New Year Festival at City University um, earlier this year. And um, from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University School of Design, there is a new Jockey Club Design Institute for Social Innovation. The Jockey Club is a big player in social innovation, and we've got a representative from the Jockey Club here today, and also from the Jockey Club Design Institute for Social Innovation. Where are you? Somewhere, somewhere, yeah. Uh, the lady in the, in the yellow t-shirt. And uh, a very, very important mapping study on Hong Kong social ecosystem was done uh, by Philo Alto and Ming Wong. Philo is there, right at the back. Uh, so the initiative is called Engage Hong Kong, and um, it is also supported by the RS Group, which is a very important um, impact investing group in Hong Kong. Okay, um, then, um, and I think, again, this is extremely important, we have a growing field of impact investors. Um, I've only listed some, uh, So Asia, we have Scott at the back, uh, Social Ventures Hong Kong, they're out there, um, they are based at the Good Lab, uh, Asia Community Ventures, started by Philo, um, and the RS Group, of course. Then, from the business sector, we have got lots of interest to support social innovation. Um, the earliest is HSBC, uh, supporting the Hong Kong Council for Social Services in their Social Enterprise Business Center. Uh, Henderson Land Group sponsored the Good Lab. Uh, it's actually a, a very big um, gesture and support. Uh, for example, you know, they gave us money to decorate the space as well as we are now getting rent-free uh, conditions uh, for the next two years. So that, that's not bad at all. And DBS, uh, Asia had some grants to scale social enterprises. And ETNet is from the Hong Kong Economic Times. Uh, they have started a uh, web platform uh, to promote social enterprises. So the Good Lab was launched on the 20th of September uh, in uh, 2012 by Chief Secretary. And the Good Kitchen will also be launched uh, this afternoon by the Chief Secretary. Um, well, the Good Lab is, is a social innovation space, so we have got membership, uh, people come here uh, to, uh, to take on cross-disciplinary projects. Uh, we have uh, got a number of networks, uh, also at the Good Lab, and these are important networks 
not only for Hong Kong, but for Greater China and Asia. The Social Enterprise Summit will enter its sixth year. Uh, the Make a Difference uh, platform, uh, as I've said, is an Asian platform for young people to make a difference. Uh, we also have the Hong Kong Social Entrepreneurship Forum, Epic Group Lab, and recently um, the HACF brought some of us to China to look at all the, uh, 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 you know, all these uh, small initiatives that are done by the people. Interestingly, uh, we are now beginning to have movements that stick. People suddenly remember that you have to go green on Monday, so meatless on Mondays. Uh, somehow, I don't know whether all of you know, but we are the biggest, biggest meat eaters in the world. Not the USA, we are Hong Kong, per capita, per person. We consume more meat than the USA. It's because we have got all these buffets, uh, we have got wedding banquets, and we waste a lot of food. So Green Monday is an initiative started by Social Ventures Hong Kong, and it tells people to go meatless on Monday. So it's really going baby steps. But it is uh, it's actually receiving a lot of very positive responses. And social enterprises and fair trade enterprises are now a very conscious ethical consumption choice. At the Tamar government headquarters, I Bakery uh, is operating um, a restaurant. We have Cafe 330 that is at the Chinese University. So these are real choices. Good kitchens downstairs. Happy veggies is in Thai, uh, is in Duan Chai. Um, people are reflecting on food. Last year, the leftovers group won the social enterprise challenge. Um, these are a group of uh, Chinese university uh, young students. They look at this food waste uh, problem in Hong Kong. They said, we are going to do something about it. So we are the volunteers. They connected with the restaurants and said, if you ever have a ban banquet, tell us, call us. So they will actually c go to the restaurant after the banquet and they will just pick up all the fried rice or the fried noodles that nobody consumes, nobody eats, and they will bring it to the, um, to the homeless people who sleep underneath the flyovers in Hong Kong. So they all do it as volunteers with no pay. And they use a Facebook group to just call friends to go and do this. Uh, it's really remarkable. Green Collar, uh, Jack Chang, also a good lab member. Um, he is starting um, um, uh, this uh, enterprise to um, uh, to turn uh, food waste uh, into uh, uh, what do you call it? into uh, into fish crop uh, no not fish crop uh, things that the fish eat what do you call that we fish food, <laughs> 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 fish food. <laughs> yeah. my mind is not working this morning <laughs> and here at the um, uh, at the group lab we've got um, interesting social innovation initiatives. Um, Vincent Wong, who was originally from the commercial radio, he started this uh, mobile uh, broadcasting van and he wants to use solution journalism. So not only to critique what's happening, but to find solutions. Uh, social housing is another Social Ventures Hong Kong project. And um, uh, what it does is um, they see a lot of empty apartments in Hong Kong. They also see uh, low-income families living in really squalid um, quarters. So they connected the two, and they hope to bring um, those single mother families to live in the empty apartments. So it had uh, successfully matched uh, with at least uh, six uh, different apartments with 18 families. Dialogue in the dark and dialogue in silence, they're going strong. And uh, right here in this space, um, they have incubated a new thing, which is called Silons Le Cabaret. And this is um, a performance by the hearing impaired, so directed by the hearing impaired and performed by the hearing impaired. It is a dinner show, it is a theater in silence. Uh, it is an amazing thing and uh, of course uh, it generates some income for the fledgling um, social enterprise. There are more co-working spaces in Hong Kong, so Good Lab is not the only one. There's Cocoon in Tin Hao, the Hive in Wan Chai, and all these uh, smaller centers around town. So this is really catching on. Uh, we have many awards for young social entrepreneurs. You can see we have Social Enterprise Challenge, we have the uh, Social Innovation Award, the Poly U Micro Fund 2013. It gives um, people, um, young people, um, seed money to start their own social enterprises. Again, in Hong Kong, money is never the issue, but I think idea and people, uh, those are the issues. And we have um, visitors. We have Lord Wei from um, 
Uh, we have Lord Wei from the UK, uh, who came in April and gave us a, a really good speech and uh, supported by the British Council. We have got British Council people here. And I just want to mention these young people. Uh, this is called a Go Inside Cafe. Uh, I have, uh, these are um, um, young people who really want to make a difference. Uh, they are not um, working in a big corporation, but they would like to be an entrepreneur and they would like to be a social entrepreneur. So what we now need, yes, time's up, I know. What we now need is tri-sector leadership and understanding. Um, I think this is what Hong Kong should work on. The government is taking the lead. Business sector is getting very interested. And uh, we've got NGOs, we've got social innovators and social entrepreneurs all coming together. Uh, I think we need to talk to each other more. Uh, we need to understand each other so that together we collaborate to meet the social needs of Hong Kong. I think that's it for me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, wow, so, so last time I saw you do that presentation, the content was very different. So thank you so much for updating us. Um, we recognize that we, we've uh, bombarded you with a huge amount of information and this will be the limit of your sitting down and listening for today. But before we move on, um, does anyone have any questions for the speakers? Any reflections, any surprises? Anything that you disagree with? Anything that you think was particularly missing? We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but any, any reflections from some of those things? Were there any things that shocked you that were similar about the different countries that you've heard of? Um, any things that you were really surprised at how different they were? Any reflections at all? Maybe, maybe one here? Great. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm Janice from the Government um, Civil Service Bureau. Um, I got a question for Joyce um, because I'm from Hong Kong, part of China. I'm very much like to know uh, whether there is any cooperation between uh, Hong Kong and the mainland China, say Beijing, um, in the area of social innovation. Uh, regarding the Hong Kong, I know there are a lot of the social enterprises and the NGOs in China. They will go to MAB and also as a uh, as a social entrepreneur forum right? and summit every year. But regarding the cooperation, no, I don't hear that there are any solid cooperation, but I know there are a lot of the exchange, experience exchange, but for the collaboration, I don't think there will be. No. Thank you, thank you. Any more, any more reflections? One here. Okay. Hi. Um, I think I'm, oh, it's on. <laughs> I'm Melinda, I was one of the, the presenters. And I really enjoyed hearing what everyone else had to say and seeing, uh, seeing how the, those pieces fit together. Uh, one of the things I noticed both for myself and with the other speakers was actually none of us explicitly mentioned failures to innovate. Um, so one of the conversations I'd be interested in having is identifying uh, gaps that we've left in social innovation in our countries and focusing not on the, the failure aspect, but identifying what those are and how we can move forward from them. Because I know I myself didn't touch on that. Great, we've got, a, we've got lots of time to do that this afternoon, so that'll be great, thank you. Anything else, anyone surprised? Um, I'm Vincent. I'm Vincent, I have a question for the seat from Macau. Um, I have an interesting point that I heard, like you have very low, they're very low unemployment rate, right? So that basically solves quite a number of social problems. And when you're talking about trying to engage in social innovation, so like what particular, there's, like, there's very high employment, so there's probably no poverty and things like that. But with social, in social innovation, what particular area of social problems you're trying to target and like, um, and whether these problems can actually be solved with finance from the government or finance from, let's say, the business sector. Thank you for your question. I uh, actually, uh, many people, students, uh, graduated students, they, they mentioned uh, they don't want to work in the casino. And if they leave the gambling industry, their salaries is very low. There is a big gap between if you 
between the, the people who work in the casino and the private sector uh, our, um, could be as big as doubled. And, and uh, everything, the inflation in Macau is very high. And I think this is a major problem why I want to do something for, for my students and, and peop young people in general. And, and I believe not everybody wants to work in the casino. So Angel, are you saying, is there, is there um, one of the challenges around aspiration and learning different, that there are different opportunities? Uh, we need alternative, alternative opportunities. And there are many, money do not solve all the problems. <laughs> if, yeah, we have money, but we don't have solutions for many things. And people, they just give up. And I have many, uh, I know many cases, they just simply leave Macau, and which is very sad. I, that's why we want to do something. Thank you. It's a very different discussion to you in Europe where uh, money is the problem. <laughs> it's part of it. So yes, we don't have very much. Uh, and it's interesting if you think about impetus and what makes you, what triggers people to do innovation. Uh, maybe it's slightly different. Hi, uh, I'm Scott from Hong Kong. Uh, one observation uh, this year is the, um, the amount of conversation around um, government uh, and public policy um, and how even in Korea, uh, the government's leading the innovation, which is, which is fantastic. Um, I, I guess uh, the opportunity, the challenge for us here in Hong Kong and other places is how um, the public sector can move beyond um, regulating and policy making to partnering. And that to me seems a very interesting development that we're beginning to experiment with here in Hong Kong, but we'd be interested in learning from um, other places about how that's going and how those of us who are not a part of the government might help to uh, prime that process. Great, I mean, that might be a longer discussion for later, but does anyone have any initial responses? Is that, no? I'll come back to that later? Good. Um, any final comments before we do something exciting? No, okay. Oh, one more. Yes. Hello, I'm Hilary Liu from Taiwan. Currently, I'm working uh, for PwC, and I'm happy to learn all the cases around um, Asia, but also I'm happy to know that there is one very mini section for Taiwan, and we do have a lot of essays, examples, and good experience regarding failures that we'd like to share with people. And also for the corporate collaboration within the SE community and also the NGOs, I'm really happy to uh, have more interaction with all. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Well, we've got lots of time this afternoon to pick some of these issues apart and discuss them in a bit more detail um, and really start to learn from each other about what other people are doing in terms of moving these issues forward. But for now, um, so we're going to be innovative and we're going to use one of those methods that is being used all around the world at the moment, um, particularly crowdsourcing. So I think this morning was incredible. There was a huge amount of things going on, but we gave our speakers a very big task to represent their countries and to tell us everything that was happening all of the organizations that were there, whether they're in terms of investors or government organizations or corporations or community organizations, we ask them to tell you a little bit about where the big challenges are. We ask you to tell them a little bit about the trends and the activities and the tools that people are using. Um, and that's a very difficult task to do in about seven minutes um, for one person. So what we're gonna do now is crowdsource and try and fill in some of those gaps. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, <coughs> so we're gonna fill in some of those gaps. Um, so we are going to create between us a living map of social innovation in Asia. Part of the reason we're doing this is because it's important to understand what is going on in other places. And a couple of individuals have really, really great overviews, but most people just know about what's going on in their own organizations and within their own networks. 
So we're going to try and share that right now. So we're going to do three rounds of crowdsourcing information. So within your tables, you have post-its and pens and things. So we're going to work in three, we're, we'll go for three broad areas. The first is events and physical things that are happening that we know about in our countries or across the region. So have a think, this is like a massive, massive brainstorm, basically. So we're going to start with events. Events that we know that our own organisation are going to do in some way in the field of social innovation. So it might be a one hour workshop, or it might be a five day extravaganza. It might be you, or it might be someone else you know of. Have a chat about it and discuss it. Then we're going to stick them up somewhere. Secondly, we're going to think about organisation who are working in this field. So this might be departments of organisations who are doing more things. So if you're you know, in Intel, um, your department that's doing something interesting, or in PwC, or it might be a community organisation, or it might be um, a part of a university or a school or whatever. The next thing is organisations, okay? So we'll start with events. I'll let you know when we move on. Second, organisations. Third is a little bit more difficult. And it's a very broad area. So third, we'll look at ways of supporting social innovation. So it might be prizes. It might be new funds. It might be, um, I don't know, it might be anything. Um, so that's the third thing we're going to crack with So what we need to do is write the things on post-its on our table, discuss them. Remember, it could be your organisation, your country, or someone else's organisation that you know about in someone else's country. And what we're going to do is we'll take all this information and we'll put it up online. So we have a much broader image, a much more comprehensive image of what's going on across this region. And we know it's so much, but it's about trying to get the information out of our own heads and into the public realm. And then we can work out what we want to do with it later on. But the first stage is getting the information out. So, for about 10 minutes, we'll start with events, then we'll do organisations, and then we'll do support. So you're on your table, I'll let you know when we're going to do the next thing, because you can put up your poster on the wall somewhere, which I'll show you, um, and then we'll do the next one. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah? Good. So our living map of social innovation across Asia.